For 33 years across more than 1,500 episodes, Firing Line provided a platform for an exchange of opinion. Welcome to Firing Line. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Caitlyn Jenner. Governor John Kasich. Madame Christine Lagarde. Speaker Paul Ryan. Our mission is to renew the Firing Line tradition for a new generation and engage new voices and viewers alike in a debate about the America we want to create in the 21st century. That's Firing Line. We have the host right here. She is, in fact, Margaret Hoover, host of Firing Line with Margaret Hoover on PBS. Hey. Hi. Welcome to the PBS family. Thank you so is much. Is this not the greatest broadcast network around? It is a total, <laughs> really, truly an honor. I mean, all of us grew up with PBS, especially, I mean, beginning, this is the most brilliant stra marketing strategy ever. Get them while they're young. Sesame Street, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. But right? you got to keep them with compelling programming. Yes, you do. And so that's what you do. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and it's, re it's really, actually, it's a, like the honor of a lifetime to be able to be part of this. Well. For those of us who are old enough to remember uh, William F. Buckley, 66 to 99, he did Firing Line. He had his own unique style, fair to say? Totally fair to say. Do you know, he was the longest running television host in television history, more than Johnny Carson. And now you're at 30 years? You were just about at 30 years. So, you know, you, you, you could beat him. Do I dress better than, do I dress better than Buckley? You dr uh, dress, I don't, he, I don't think he thought he, his dress was no. the distinguishing feature of his performance. I know I'm not as smart as Buckley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How was, smart was William F. Buckley? Buckley, William F. Buckley was incredibly Like bright. scary smart. He was smart, but what, the thing that he was um, best at was his locution. He would use <laughs> multisyllabic words over and over and over again that forced everybody to sit and watch his show before you could watch with multiple screens with a dictionary in your lap and a thesaurus. So you could try to figure out what he was saying. I mean, that was, that was the signature sure. riff about Buckley is his um, choice in words and his mastery of the English language, both with the pen and with his tongue. And a conservative intellectual who made people think whether they agreed with him or not and you take on the mantle of this show with your own brand, your own style, your own approach. You identify as a quote unquote conservative. You're clearly an intellectual, um, but it's different times, very different. So let's put this right out there. The Donald Trump brand of quote unquote conservatism, Republican conservatism, you're shaking your head as I speak, and the Margaret Hoover brand, not that you were here on public broadcasting to express your point of view, but you have been a commentator before, and we do know your track record. Different? A hundred percent different. I mean, they're even different than William F. Buckley's brand of conservatism. Absolutely. William F. Buckley Jr. really was one of the, I would say he was the most uh, uh, prominent public intellectual of the modern American conservative movement, certainly as a television personality because of Firing Line. That's right. And, uh, the conservative movement, when it started, and it's in the 1950s around the formation of a National Review, the magazine that he founded, That's right. embodied a series of ideas. But it was basically this, this group of people that had totally different ideas that formed together in a coalition, and there were three parts. Um, Reagan sort of loosely referred to them as three pillars of the stool, or three legs of the stool. But the early modern American conservative movement in the 50s and 60s was economic libertarians, right. anti-communists, and traditionalists. But not, they didn't, I mean, it was even before Roe v. Wade. It was, they were, these were people who thought that um, organized society was becoming too secular. And, and, they, and they thought that there was a place for religion, whatever religion it was, to have a, a place in the public square. And that's why the prayer in school fights uh, right. sort of became part of the public Buckley debate happened to be of the Catholic. conservative. He was very Catholic. Happened. He was very. A, like an Orthodox Catholic. Um, an Orthodox Catholic. He was quite observant. He really, he yes. really was. I mean, there are most Catholics these days are pro-life, pro-choice rather, not pro-life. Right. Buckley was a really traditional Catholic. Uh, that is incredibly different than the modern, than the con current conservative movement is, that Donald Trump has really co-opted. Sorry for interrupting, Margaret. Is Donald Trump the Republican slash conservative party thing today? Is he it? I mean, the conservative movement has become something very different than it was under Buckley. With Buckley, it was an intellectual movement. And then, you know, under Reagan and then later Bush in the 90s and in 2000s, it has become something broader than just an intellectual movement, right? There's a grassroots movement um, that is very big. It's sort of grassroots and, and the intellectual sphere. What's happened now? is there is a conservative architecture in Washington, D.C. 
that Paul Ryan not so endearingly calls the conservative industrial complex. What does that mean? And it means that there have been entities that have now been in place for decades that sort of support quote unquote conservative causes, whoever the president is. And I think in my view, and I think Buckley would argue this too, that they've become untethered from some of those original ideas that define the modern American conservative movement that Buckley espoused. So you don't see conservatives in Washington DC anymore arguing for debt and deficits and fiscal responsibility. That those two ideas have become totally delinked. So I think there's a real really good argument that the conservative movement today that Donald Trump you know, pretends to put his arms around, I think pretends to put his arms around, I'm going to anger some people for saying that, is very disconnected. How did he the co-opt it? The modern How did Donald movement. Trump with, with his past... Party. Well, hold, on, hold on one second, Mark. Respectfully, with his track record of the things that he had said over the years, including that, that Hillary Clinton got a rural deal, she would have been a good candidate at the time. Bill Clinton was unfairly uh, persecuted, prosecuted, impeached. He didn't think it was a particularly serious offense. And the fact that he funded Democrats all those years who were running for office, and then he's the leader of the Republican Party slash, he's a conservative. I, listen, that's not my opinion. Those are facts, and I'm curious as to, from your view, and by the way, you call yourself an exiled, if you will. I'm a Republican in exile. Okay. How did he, and I don't even know if the word is co-opt. He but owns how, it now. I mean, he owns it. He owns here's what it. Happened. Here's what, here's he's what, not even I renting mean, it, he owns it. He, here's what happened, though. I mean, and this is something that, Beware the Democrats coming in 2020 when you have 20 people on the stage or more fighting for that nomination. What happened in the Republican Party is you had, Donald Trump never won a plurality. He never won a majority of votes. Sure. He never won a majority of votes. But the majority of Republican primary voters split their votes between everybody else. And so the ideas that the conservative movement has always espoused, all the other candidates were fighting over. And he occupied this different lane. And then over time, over time, over time, you know, it, it ended up What's getting that lane? The, the, it Describe was, that lane. I think it's economic populism. I think it's people who are disaffected with the current status. I think there was a, a real um, group of Republicans and Republican primary voters who were quite concerned uh, as it whittled down to Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush. They're concerned about another Bush. Um, they're concerned about uh, Ted Cruz. Everybody had a strong opinion. And by the way, it was a circular firing squad on the conservative side. Everybody shot everybody else thinking Donald Trump wasn't a serious yeah, candidate. But, but here's the part that was always confusing to me is Ronald Reagan was able to attract the disaffected disproportionately white working class voters in key states, Michigan, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Ohio, et cetera. Without calling people names, without demonizing others, without saying the most horrific, disrespectful and disgusting things about women and laughing about it. So I, I'm confused as to how much of it was, I love that Donald Trump says what he thinks versus ideologically he represents me. Or, Am I, I making even too think, much of this? I, I sometimes I think you and I want to think that there's a lot more behind about the ideas and the policies behind a candidate. And in the case of Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, there was amongst the Republican primary base and amongst a lot of people just a lot of dislike for Hillary Clinton, and a lot of dislike for Washington, and a lot of dislike for the establishment. And for a lot of people, they were throwing their lot into, well, how bad can he do? Like, let's tr let's mix it because, up. Because quote, try I don't different. like her. I don't like her. That was a lot of it. Certainly, but then there was also a lot of, of like, you know, if Donald Trump is good at anything, he is incredibly good at marketing, right? Drain the swamp, throw the guy, throw the crooks out, um, make, let's mix it up. And I think people took a, a calculated risk, thinking, well, maybe he can do something different because you know these other people have all been in power for a really long time, and look at where we are. And there's a lot of hurt. And by the way, we should make it clear that we are taping at the end of 2018. We do not know exactly what's going to happen as it relates to um, different investigations going on right now, reports that may be coming out. If you're predicting, does Donald Trump serve out this full term? I think he does. I think he should, as long as there's not you know, okay. some sort of legal process, right? Uh, Donald Trump should be legally. removed uh, uh, through any other process than a, a, a totally legal and constitutional process. And I think the way we change presidents in this country is by voting for another president or voting somebody out or in again. That's the best way to do it. Do you um, see a Republican running against? I'm sorry, make your point. I apologize <laughs> for interrupting. I mean, there's a real question I, uh, about whether Donald Trump will want to run again, right? Donald Trump, of course, thinks he's going to run again. and. 
this is a, a theory that is being banted about, maybe by people who, uh, on the Republican side, hope that somebody else can come in and save the party or take it back to its original roots or in a better course or direction. But there is this real question about whether Donald Trump is going to be able to weather the storm of a Democratic Congress that has him under investigation, members of his family being called up to testify before Democratic intelligence committees, being able to withstand, withstand 20 candidates single-handedly putting their fire on him unilaterally, and the criticism over and over and over again may just be a very different level of uh, fire than he's willing to, mm. to endure for another two years or another four years. Before I let you out of here, you're a head of a nonprofit that's making a difference in the lives of a lot of people who have suffered for too long for no good reason. Describe it. Thanks. It's American Unity Fund, and we're, an, up the website we're an advocacy organization. And what we do is we... Um, work with Republican and conservative legislatures across the country to help secure LGBT equality and freedom. And now that seems like it's a cause for a dinner party joke, right? <laughs> You're working with Republicans to help secure How'd LGBT you get into equality. It? Um, I worked in, on marriage equality here in New York and uh, lobbied the legislators up in Albany. You know, New York was a really important state in the in the LGBT equality movement because it was the first state that passed marriage through a legislature with a Republican Senate. And it was Republican leadership that allowed that uh, bill to come to a vote. And it was four very courageous Republican legislators who voted for marriage equality. And that model in New York, we then were able to export to other states around the country that were states that needed to pass it with Republican support. And so that's where we started. But the truth is, the places where LGBT freedoms are being eroded because of the marriage decision uh, are happening mostly in red states across the country. And so you actually have to build strong alliances of Republicans across the country in order to help secure those freedoms. Important and that's work. what we do. So if people want to see, by the way, Fireline is shot right here. Right here. In the studio at the Tisch WNET studio, seen across the nation on public broadcasting, but in our market, WNET, NJTV, New Jersey, out on the island. Um, thank you. And uh, you added, you continue to add a great deal to the public broadcasting family. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. I really All appreciate the best. it. Love you. You got show. it. Thank you very much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Rowan University, Atlantic Health System, New Jersey Sharing Network, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, New Jersey Resources, and by Wells Fargo. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.